First, let me thank you for the opportunity to present our views as realtors and citizens of Mississauga. We live in the city, work in the city, raise our children in the city, and are proud to be citizens in this great metropolis, so aptly managed by our worship and council for so many years. The Mississauga Real Estate Board has supported efforts of uh, City Hall, councillors and her worship, Hazel McCallion, in, her continuous, in their continuous effort to bring uh, Mississauga to the pinnacle of success as one of the best cities in uh, North America. We value and appreciate the positive lifestyle, the lifestyle that effort have generated and wish to all our hearts to maintain that position as we move forward. As you know, our beloved uh, mayor is also an honorary member of the Mississauga Real Estate Board and has been for many years. Her honor has been a great supporter of the board and we of the city. We value that relationship. We don't need uh, to tell you uh, that in comparison with Toronto, Mississauga holds its own. Thanks to the mayor and council, Mississauga runs a tight ship and knows how to spend resources that make Mississauga one of the most desirable urban cities. There's no other city that compares with the opportunities we have here in Mississauga. We raise our families in a clean environment, run our businesses, enjoy our public parks, our shopping centers, our theaters, fine arts and sports. And that was part of my speech, but I'm going to retract it, free parking. We just had to be parking downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> so this is our Mississauga. Mississauga Real Estate Board here is, speak, is here to speak on behalf of 5,000 realtors and colleagues who help to create jobs and stimulate Mississauga's economic growth. It is our belief as citizens and practitioners that the healthy real estate market is fundamental to the city's economic vibrancy, and therefore we are here today to communicate, to communicate our opposition to the city, this city's attempt to obtain the right to implement the municipal land transfer tax. Mississauga Real Estate Board, its members and citizens of Mississauga understand that taxation is necessary for quality services but it is imperative, imperative that such taxes are fair and equitable and do not have the tremendous or unintended consequences. We believe a municipal land transfer tax fails both of these tests, and the public agrees with us. Recent uh, polling uh, conducted by Ipsos Street, a viable and respected polling agency, has found that the public does not support the municipal transfer tax as a solution to increase municipal fiscal uh, pressures without consequences. So specifically, the, the poll found that 75% of GTE residents uh, planning to purchase a home in the next two years indicated that they are more likely to purchase a home in the 905 region to avoid paying the Toronto land transfer tax. Clearly, not having municipal land transfer tax uh, gives the, the city of Mississauga a competitive edge in the, in the GTA. We have, gained, we have gained by Toronto's loss. Why would we consider throwing in such a position away? 
to address some councillors' comment published by the media regarding the Ipsos 3 poor result, results, we can assure you that Ipsos 3 is one of Canada's most respected public opinion research firms and that the questions were worded clearly and fairly. The full Ipsos commentary was disseminated to, city, to the city previously and is too lengthy to be taken here, but we would be happy to provide the, the precise wording of the questions, support for the sample size, margin of errors, and other details that are available if requested. It comes as no surprise that the public opposes an additional municipal land transfer tax. Through involvement, citizens feel the impact of such, such taxation and the problems it creates. They understand an unfair tax for they see one. As noted in the uh, C.D. Howe Institute uh, report, the Toronto land transfer tax has dampened home sales by 16%. That means that Toronto real estate market would be performing 16% better if not for the extra land transfer tax. Translation, it equates to about 8,000 more home sales every year that are not realized in Toronto because of this tax. Also, let's not forget the importance of housing sales in Mississauga's economy. A study conducted by Altus Group found that every resale housing transaction in Ontario generates an average of about $40,000 in spin-off spending on things like renovations, moving costs, furnishings, appliances, and the like. That means that every house sale in Mississauga that's lost would take $40,000 spending dollars out of Mississauga's income. Not good for the job that depends on such spending, and not certainly not good for the city. Although we believe the economic impact of this tax would be significant, we believe the more important issue is that of its burden on our citizens. For the average home buyer of a detached home in Mississauga, a municipal land transfer tax set at the same rate as Toronto's would cost an approximately $10,000 extra. Payable in full and upfront. It's not right to expect only people who are purchasing a home to pay so much more in tax than other residents for the same level of service as everyone else. We must also consider that many people move not out of choice, but out of necessity. A few examples. Seniors downsizing and who depend on the equity in their homes to survive decently for the rest of their lives. Young growing families acquiring additional space, but with limited finances. Family breakups, with parents subjected twice to such a tax, just to be able to secure the same level of life for their children. People who experience a disability and through no fault of their own must of need move to another property. And the list can go on. This tax would be the straw that would break the camel's back. ensure the city continues to thrive, but we cannot emphasize enough a municipal land transfer tax is not the way to go. Having drawn information from several independent respected sources that indicate a negative impact of a municipal land transfer tax, in addition to our belief of such a tax being unfair, it is our humble recommendation that the city explores alternatives to the financing to their city. Mississauga Real Estate Board wants to be part of the solution. 
as a collaborative partner. It is our understanding that city staff have been asked by Council for more information and reviews of, be of best practices for similar cities in North America to determine the best Mid and Mississauga solution, and we applaud that initiative. Please take heed of our industry experience and that of our neighbors and let us work together for a better solution. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure and thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much. And, you know, I've, I've always felt like I'm part of the extended family of the Sawyer Real Estate Board view the fact that my father was a broker for over 40 years and, in fact, was one of the um, founders of the Minnesota Real Estate Board and served as you have, Bob, as, as president of the, of the board for a term. So I've always felt very close to the Minnesota Real Estate Board. And just for clarification, and I believe you know that um, right now, uh, the city of Mississauga does not have the authority to impose such a tax. Um, but you're here at, at the right time because it certainly was a recommendation from our staff to review the feasibility or the possibility of such a tax. And I just want to be clear with you as well that um, when this was originally discussed, I, I am on the record already for not supporting such a tax. city or reinvest in our city should be imposed such a tax and a hardship um, because they want to invest in, in, this, in the city, be it through real estate. And you both find many of the reasons why it shouldn't be imposed. Um, you know, I, I look at young families that are struggling now to try to come up with a down payment, and particularly due to the fact that the federal government changed the legislation with respect to mortgages to 25 years or rather amortized rather than 30 years. I, I felt that they should have kept the 30 but after the 30, or after five years, imposed that they can't extend it back to 30, that it would be 25 days in that way. That would have been a much <laughs> But this, this tax certainly would have hardship on first time buyers, too. If you look at already at the region of Peel, how we've increased our development charges. And I'm a strong believer in development charges, and I know our council is. I've always looked at it as being uh, an initiation fee for being in our city and then the taxes are your membership. But uh, you don't add another tax like this uh, on top of that. And uh, it certainly, uh, as it was outlined in the CD Howard report, we've indicated here today, a 16% decrease in sales is, uh, you know, it's quite a major hit on any, on any municipality. And already young buyers are looking to Milton, to Brampton, and uh, outside of Mississauga, and it's hurting your industry. I've got a lot of the comments, but I got a whole list here. I just wanted to go on record and say that I am opposed to uh, implementing any such tax. My first speaker is Jim Toby. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. First, I'd like to compliment the Mississauga Real Estate Board for uh, not only the work you but the work you do in the community. You do absolutely outstanding work in the community. I've seen so many of your charitable events and so many of your great leaders as far as supporting the community. We really appreciate that. Uh, actually, I just wanted to have a little bit of a conversation with you today. I have some questions to ask. I have some facts to give you and some questions to ask because I, I, I'm really uh, absolutely, I've, I've been excited all weekend that you're actually going to be here because we, we have a huge structural uh, challenge. Um, the, fir the first thing I offer was, was the, the context uh, of the discussion around municipal land transfer tax really was about uh, getting more tools in the toolbox and uh, the crash jumped all over the land transfer. But really, it really is about it. And it, the, the reason being is that the city of Mississauga is currently going into uh, our capital uh, replacement deficit is running annually $85 million a year, of which we are putting $9.75 million away. So that's that's one thing. Approximately nine million. Isn't, it, isn't that it, right? What's our exact? It, it's a little more like it'll be around $31 million. Yeah, transfer to capital. So what's so what, what what's our capital deficit running at? Well, our capital deficit, if you want to talk in terms of 2013, and our our, our annual depreciation is running around over 100 around 110 million, and we're contributing around 30 some million, 31 million. So I think the short.
short calls right where you said around Yes, yeah, so the short calls around 70 some odd, roughly seventy million dollars. And and the reason that that's occurring, I, mean, I was quite shocked with that. I'm, I'm kind of a statistic nut. And um, in, in, during the 1950s, the infrastructure in Canada was on, on, almost equally. The, pro, the provincial governments owned about a third, the municipalities owned about a third, and the federal government owns about a third. But now, uh, today, fast forward 55 years, and the municipalities now own 65% of the infrastructure in this country. The, uh, pro, the provincial uh, and territorial government is still own 32%, but the federal government, who gets uh, a much larger piece of the pie, only owns 3% of the infrastructure. So, and then when you throw all the tax dollars on the table, the income tax, the cigarettes, liquor, everything, uh, the municipalities get 9 cents. So my first question to you would be, how do you make those numbers work? We have 65%, and you spoke, you know, glowingly about what a great city in Mississauga is, and the reason it's great is because we own $7 million worth of infrastructure that we have to maintain, we have to pay people to maintain, we have to repair constantly, and we have to replace, and that's the kicker. So, my question to you is, how the heck do you make those numbers work? Uh, that's a great question. Thank you very much for asking me and putting me on the spot. But, uh, <laughs> obviously, we're not in a position of your knowledge or experience in knowing this, but we would appreciate you being a stakeholder in your, in your discussions and we will find a way to, uh, to find you these dollars. Yeah, well, that's one question. And I guess a couple more questions I have is, you know, if we keep going down this road, I think if, I, if we keep going down, if we keep keep this situation going where we're not putting enough money in for capital uh, capital infrastructure replacement and our roads start to deteriorate, our community centers and our pools, what's that going to do to your business? How is that going to help your business? I can step forward on that. I think that, uh, as we all know, there's a very huge issue right now with respect to uh, creating affordable housing in our fine city. And we're at a point right now where we investigated the second suites and all that's coming to play. We have just under the affordability because people are moving into the city. If we turn around and do an about face and create land transfer taxes, we'll shy people away from moving in, which will then deteriorate any excess uh, revenues to stimulate our economy. It's actually a move that we gain on one side and we hurt on another. Yeah, I, guess I sorry, think the, sorry to interrupt, but I guess my question, you know, my, my question earlier was that, you know, if we're running an annual capital infrastructure deficit of 70 million a year, like, that's only going to impact on our growth, and we, we've got it, we have to take some kind of measure, so that's why, that's why staff have brought forward the report on, on not just the municipal land transfer tax, but other forms of taxation, and the other piece that we have to do as well is to get that free, get the, get the federal government to kick in on the 3%, and that's where I'm hoping that you could help us, because we need all the help we can get to convince the federal government they need to if they bankrupt municipalities, well, the country isn't going to be in great shape, and your, your business is going to be terrible, absolutely terrible. If we have to start closing community centers, it's not going to be good for the real estate business. No, not at all. We, we appreciate that, and as we said, we are prepared to be a part of your stakeholders into the discussions to find a better solution to this. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Yannick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Bossy lived there very nice to see you. In fact, uh, I've counseled you and there are a lot of us been around a long time, so I think you recognize a lot of the faces. A lot of the faces from my best friend used to do what you do. Carlo Racho, who was president of the real estate board. That's a tribute I get to me and my best friend that after 40 years, he can call me and say, Nando, we don't need to discuss this, do we? And I said, no, we don't. Uh, because he understood uh, dead set against this. But I think Councillor Toby's comments are well put. What we have here, this is bad public policy in my opinion. Don't be surprised, we have a lot of bad public policy in Canada. It's, it's perverse, and it's the theory of the one-off, because we don't tax things directly. This is why we're in so much trouble. There's a lovely Yiddish expression that I like. It's the one that says, a drowning man or woman will reach for even the tip of a sword. The problem is we shouldn't be drowning to begin with, and we shouldn't be reaching for swords, but in fairness to Councilor Toby, that's the predicament in. But the reason why this is illogical, it is unethical, it is immoral, is because our core business, in my opinion, here as a council, is we service real property. That's what you pay your property tax for. When you generate wealth, we take on another role. You owe us levies. You're building a property, you've got to put a water line, a sewer line in, you have to build a community center, something. So you pay your levies. People understand that linear relationship. Here we are taxing you with no good reason at all. You touched upon some of the examples. Somebody today, for good or for bad, 
someone has a different lifestyle, wants to change over the house, my neighbor regularly. The person next door, like my father, lived in the same house for 35 years. Why over the course of their lives would one pay tens of thousands of dollars more? I have, I have no understanding of the logic. So why am I asking you to pay for it? It's disproportionate, it's unfair, though there's a hypocrisy in the entire room when I look at all of you when I say that. That's fundamentally true of the tax in and of itself. In that, as I understand it, and I recently went through it five years ago, where, God bless us, we bought a very nice home. The land transfer tax on my home, because I understand the numbers, when you whittle down what the city gets on our portion of the tax bill, the land transfer tax on my home would have paid eight years of municipal tax. I didn't get anything. Five years gone by, somebody went to the land registry office and at least physically changed the name. Now they do it by computer. So province of Ontario, what the hell did you do for me for 8,000 or 12,000? What did you do? Well, I should read your name to it. <laughs> so now we're going to pile on. It makes no sense. But it's what our governments have been built around. I tend to buy only used cars a little bit more affordable. I'm sure some of the used cars I bought, by the time the resale and the resale tax on a used car, it was more than the damn car when it started. And provincial government, can you tell me why I put your name where his name was? But did you plow a road? Did you build a community? No. But that's the perversity of our society, where the state already owns 80% of all the land and 56% of all your money. And now I'm going to pile on. I don't think so. So, in fairness to Councillor Toby, his fundamental point is right. Where the system is broken is we own 66% of all the stuff. Federal government owns three. We get eight or nine cents on the top. The model is broken, but why create more bad public policy to fix bad public policy? So for all of those reasons, I cannot support it. I want to go a step further at the appropriate time, Mr. Chair. Let's get these good people back to work. Let's let not have homeowners worry about this, this odious tax that just would make no sense. I would like to think it isn't even the realm of possibility. So just like the last step in it, I think we should officially let it be known, and I remove that motion, that we're not going forward with this discussion anymore. Councilor, you need to just to your point too, uh, and the audience knows that the highest cost of closing is your land transfer. Yep. <laughs> and it, and it's, always, it's always been my pet peeve too, that you pay it on the total of the property, and it should be, in my opinion, the difference between what the property sold for the last time and what the purchaser pays for it for this time. <laughs> Thanks for saying. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I guess we can make the group that's here today happy, or we can make all the residents of Mississauga happy by not raising their taxes. But at the end of the day, we have to find the money somewhere. And first of all, I, I appreciate that, uh, that you're here today. I've always enjoyed working with the Mississauga Real Estate Board. And uh, I was going to say I don't have any relatives that are real estate agents, but actually I do. My husband's cousin is, uh, is a realtor, but I don't think I have a conflict of interest as she doesn't work in Mississauga. So. Um, but uh, you do a lot for the city. You do. You all do. And uh, I have many good friends who are real estate agents, and I, I have spoken about this as well, and, and I fully understand where you are coming from. And I hope that you also understand where we are coming from in looking at, as Councillor Toby said, the opportunities to get as many tools in our toolbox as possible. You know, if, if our roads deteriorate, if our city deteriorates, if our infrastructure deteriorate, deteriorates, as it has in many of the U.S. cities, who have not put money into improving their infrastructure. And you know as real estate agents that that has partially impacted, I mean, all of the other financial stuff in the U.S. and the economic the economy has impacted real estate prices in the U.S. as well. But I have many friends down there who are sitting owning uh, houses where the mortgage is more than the house is worth. And in some, of the, in some cases, it's because of the financial economic uh, turnaround. But in other cases, it's because the municipality has not been putting money into repairing the infrastructure. Communities have deteriorated to a point that nobody wants to buy their house because no one wants
wants to live there. They don't even want to live there, but they can't sell their house because they can't get a buyer. So we have to be very careful that we're not throwing out an option, disposing of an option before we have even researched it, and we have not researched it in detail at this point, to, to say, is, is this a feasible option? Is it something that we can do? Because as we said, we are, we are in a shortfall. Our reserves that we built up very, very carefully, and you know, many of you have been around this soccer for a long time, and you know that every year our surplus went into capital reserves putting it away for that rainy day when we knew we would have to be repairing an aging infrastructure that we were able to build, you know, building a brand new city, building up a city up to 800,000 people takes a lot of, a lot of uh, investment in new infrastructure that one day is going to start deteriorating. It's costing us double to replace our roads, to replace our bridges, to repair them. No one ever anticipated that, you know, you plan something that would have that you might have put away you know five million dollars for over the last 15 20 years is now costing us seven eight to ten million dollars so the money that we put away is just not enough and we will be going into debt we know that and as real estate agents you know that de debt is a natural occurrence I mean I doubt that very many of the people that buy houses don't go into debt don't take a mortgage it's nice to pay cash for a house, but it's also not realistic. And we all struggle to pay that back and do all the repairs in our homes. And that is good for the economy. It's very good for the economy. And we will be doing that. But at this point, you know, at the end of the day, I might be sitting here saying, I'm totally against the land transfer tax. I certainly hated paying it to the province, as Councillor Shemekeeka said, um, because it doesn't go for anything. At least we don't know where it goes for. If I was paying it, I, if I was given a choice, if I was buying a house and I was given a choice to be putting the land transfer tax, giving it to the province, into the black hole, or to the municipality where I know it's going to be used to replace infrastructure, I can tell you where I would prefer to, to put the money. None of us like paying that additional tax. We hate paying the lawyers when, uh, for huge, huge fees. We kind of wonder what did they do for that at the end of the day. Um, but, you know, that, that's something that we don't have too much choice about. We do have a choice on this, you know. And at this point in time, I, I guess I just feel that we cannot, I, I cannot in all conscience today say, no, I'm not going to entertain the idea. I'm not going to, to even look at it. Because we've heard from one group and, and we want to hear from more people. Uh, the only people, I've, uh, quite honestly, that I've heard from against it are real estate agents. And we've been hearing from a lot of you over the last few days. The emails. I have not had, I have not had one resident contact me and say it's a bad idea. So if you want to tell my residents to contact me, please do, because I'd love to hear from you. But if I go through my emails and my phone messages, I have not had any. But we want to hear from residents. We want to hear from the agents. We want to hear from everyone. We have your report that you sent us, the C.D. Howe report. We have another report that we heard from that was a different story. So, you know, just to sit here and say, no, I'm not even going to entertain that. I'm not even going to look at the possibility without having all of the information would be very irresponsible. So I'm, I'm not going to make you very happy today, as Councillor Nika did, and say I'm, I'm voting totally against it because I don't have all the information. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you know, uh, I, I'm, I, if we move ahead, we're not supporting it today. We're not endorsing it today. We're not applying it today. We're not even talking about it in this budget for 2013. What we are looking at and what we asked staff to do originally was to bring us all the information, do our homework as we've always done, and then make the decision. So yes, we could we could say today and you know, nope, we're not going to do it, we're not even going to look at it. And then my residents are going to say, but how are you going to get that money? Well, we're going to tax all of you. We're going to increase your taxes. 
you know, and if that's what, if, and if that's what the residents say they would prefer, if that's what they say they would prefer, then no problem, no problem. I, I, absolutely, you are taxpayers, and we're hearing from you. We're hearing from you today, and that's a good thing. I want to hear from more residents before I make a decision, because as I said, I have not today. So, I, you know, I appreciate I appreciate your report, and I would really, I would really like to see what the questions were that were asked, because I was one who was quoted as being skeptical about surveys, and I am. You know, we, we spend a lot of money on surveying residents in the city as well, and it all depends on how you ask the question. And that would really help me to get a much better picture of what people were, what information they were given, what questions were asked, and what the outcome is. So, I, you know, I mean, if you want to blame me for doing my homework before I make a decision, well, I would very proud to stand behind being blamed for doing my homework before saying yes or no to a decision. We're, 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 not, uh, we're not blaming anybody here. We're just seeing that it's an unfair tax. Yeah. We would be happy to provide you with the information that we have, as long as you would be, able, you would be willing as well to provide us with information that you have about reports that, that suggest that this is the way to go. And, and, and I would love to sit down with you. I would love to sit down with you personally and discuss it more in detail and go over all of the information that we have because I want to be better informed before I make a decision, not after. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wore my Century 21 jacket in solidarity. <laughs> <laughs> my father was a commercial and industrial real estate broker. Of course, he's been passed for many years, but I know how hard he worked for every percentage of dollar income he earned, so I have great sympathy for the cause. Um, that said, the genesis of this, and I'm going to ask Janice in one second to explain how we got here, but of course it becomes, speaks to our infrastructure deficit. And we were looking at revenue tools. And I think you all know that. We were just speculating on where money could come from, where could it be raised. And of course, we looked at Toronto and saw that they had taxing powers, which we don't. They have the vehicle registration tax, and they have the land transfer tax, right? So I think we looked at, is that something we should consider? And then everyone got nervous, right? Um, of course, we got nervous after we saw the CD Howe report and the unintended consequences. So I think that was the genesis. Janice, can you correct me? How did this come to be that this came, even came up and we brought forward to council? Um, well, I mean, and I think you've all touched on aspects of it. We've been um, discussing for a number of years our growing infrastructure deficit, and that really has come about because so much of our infrastructure, which was built, built with de development levies, in the future is going to have to be repaired and replaced with tax dollars. Uh, today, if we had to increase our property taxes to fill the infrastructure gap, uh, we would be looking at somewhere in the order of a 25 to 30 percent increase in our in our property taxes. Um, we know that based on uh, changes that were made to the Municipal Act and the City of Toronto Act years ago, Toronto was given revenue tools um, as a quote-unquote pilot project. Um, and at that time, there was discussion that once there was experience with these tools, then Toronto uh, or the other municipalities uh, could look at legislative, legislative changes similar to that. About a year ago, um, I was approached by members of council saying, can we look at this, can we look at this? Uh, and then in uh, June, you'll recall, uh, that we had a budget off-site uh, where we looked at a number of different possibilities and options to look at uh, different solutions to closing uh, the infrastructure gap and council at that time asked if staff could bring a report forward on the, the tax tools uh, that Toronto has and in particular uh, to look at the land transfer tax. So we did that. Um, and uh, as you've noted, um, at this point in time, we are legislatively prohibited from using any of these tax tools. So the very first step in this process before any local decisions would be made would be to simply ask the province to give us the toolbox. How we choose to use it once we have the toolbox is up to us, but right now we don't have the option to use any of those tools as the City of Toronto does. 
And while I understand, uh, you know, that there are um, pros and cons to any of these tax tools, um, you know, we looked at what the City of Toronto was doing. They're, they're the one that they've used primarily uh, is the land transfer tax. We've studied the CD Howe report. Uh, we've looked at it. Um, I, I mean, it, you know, it's interesting. They talk about a 16% reduction in sales volume, but they also talk about an increase in, in home renovations. Well, home renovations create jobs and value and taxes um, as well. Um, so, you know, we're in council's hands. Uh, we were asked, uh, we brought forward a report. Um, I think it was approved initially at committee and then when it got to council it was referred back. So it is back in our hands. Our intention was to uh, work with the City of Toronto who are also looking at the CD Howe report uh, and to come back to council once we've had an in indication of Toronto's analysis and we've not received that yet. Um, to basically provide additional feedback and information to council on the tools and particularly the land transfer tax. But I would ask if council in the majority or budget committee in the majority today isn't supportive of moving forward, there really is not a lot of purpose in staff spending more time on this issue. So I would ask for some clarity today as to whether you do or don't want us to continue working on this issue. And, and I think we'll get to, get to that. How much revenue did it provide the City of Georgia? Um, my recollection is the City of Toronto is somewhere in the order of 280 to 300 million dollars. Uh, and we did a calculation based on Toronto's program. One thing I do want to make clear, because it's been raised a couple of different times, in fact, first time home buyers get a rebate of the tax in Toronto, so it actually does not affect home, first time home buyers up to I think a value in excess of $400,000. So we mirrored. Um, does that mean condominiums as well, Janice? It's all homes. Well, I, it, it doesn't make a distinction in the information that I have. It just says first time home buyers, so I'm assuming it doesn't matter what type of home you purchase. Um, so we basically mirrored Toronto's program and applied it to the um, uh, transactions that have occurred in Mississauga just as a proxy for what a program might look like. So if, in other words, if we took Toronto's program and put it in our environment, it would generate somewhere in the order of 70 to $75 million annually. And when you've got a gap of 80 plus million dollars, it's a it pretty nice, like a nice it's a pretty nice spend. So, um, so, you know, again, I mean, um, and does that 75 million include the rebate that would go back to first time home buyers? My understanding is we apply Toronto's program as it currently exists, so we eliminated first time home buyer transactions. You're able to get that information through Statistics Canada and some of these, uh, these areas. So we, as, as closely as we could, we mirrored uh, Toronto's rates and the rebates and programs that they provide. And the last time this came to GC and we all got cold feet because the CD Howell report had just been released, we were about to ask the mayor to write to the premier to ask for possible revenue tools, of which this might be one, but there are others, correct? And it was the mayor that, that did not advocate for the land transfer tax. Let's make that very clear. We were giving her instruction to write to the premier to ask for a tool, pick one. Am I correct? Well, the, that was the staff recommendation that uh, the province be requested uh, to amend the municipal to provide the tax tool kit that Toronto has. So that it was at that time, and I, as I say, recommended by committee to council and then deferred at council. But there are other options, I suppose, that we can write to the Premier and ask them perhaps we can lobby both the provincial and the federal government for 100% of the gas tax money rather than the $20 billion share we have currently. Well, I mean, I think. There, yes, we can do that. Um, I think that the, the challenge becomes, do you want revenue tools that you control yourself and therefore are sustainable and predictable, or do you want to be um, in, in a position where at any point in time, uh, revenue that's provided by the federal and provincial government is taken away? And quite frankly, we've been in that position historically. 
Uh, we used to get a fairly significant subsidy for transit. Those subsidies have pretty much all but disappeared. Uh, so I think that's the dilemma. And I would also point out that Ontario municipalities are probably the most restricted in terms of having access to revenue tools. I mean, any one of us who travels and goes to and stays in a hotel 